Okay, good afternoon, friends. Uh, wonderful to see you as always. And I hope you're continuing to use these different times. I'm sure your, your schedule, like mine, is not back to any kind of normal rhythm. But like I say every week, what a great opportunity to notice different patterns, different things that can help us to grow and develop together. Uh, probably spending more time with family and a closer circle of friends. So anyway, it's just a reminder. I try to do that every day, recognizing, okay, it's different. So how can I turn this into a positive thing? Just like Bob, your kind comment to uh, Rich. So speaking of noticing, since three o'clock this morning, <clears throat> we've had nonstop rain. So we're getting, for those of you who watch the weather, that Hurricane Sally that came up the Gulf Coast is now, or has been sitting, I think it's about ready to retreat, but we've just been inundated by rain. And I have to say, I love the rain. <laughs> I really have, even this morning I said, oh, this today's gonna be so great, it's never gonna stop raining. It's gonna be dark, it's gonna be great. <laughs> and I thought to myself afterwards, now why did I say that? And uh, Toy since I love the rain. When it was raining, <laughs> you could double the odds that he was gonna pull out some classic, poem, some epigram from Sai Kong Tong or some other classic text. Why? I mean, rain is perfect, right? You're, you're now familiar with those epigrams in Sai Kong Tong. What does rain mean? Well, in all these, these verses that Toy Sensei memorized, I mean, it's, it's a plethora of opportunity, right? Cleansing, uh, nourishing, uh, feeding. It's about uh, giving life, right? Or, or what about just that beautiful notice, you know, just imagine a leaf in front of you and there's that bead of water just flying down the leaf and then it's holding at the end and it just drops. And when that happens, Toy Sensei would always say, you know, you can be reminded that you're not separate, right? You are the universe and the universe is you. Are you looking at things relatively or from an absolute perspective. So anyway, um, rain is just, well, it's one of the five elements, right? Water, during the celebration or the dedication I shared you, I said, uh, water which gives life. And I was pouring the water onto the stone. And uh, that's called biophilia in sociobiology, biophilia, just this, in, this instinctive love of nature. Anyway, rain brings this out, to me anyway, so um, I always enjoy the rain. <laughs> All right, enough about rain. Are you interested in really cool things like helicopters and motorcycles? <laughs> well, if you're interested in such fun things, you're going to love today. The title of today's talk, I love the title too that they chose, is it's not about you focusing on helping others. So Bardinelli Sensei and Butiker Sensei together will discuss how following key principles of leadership have helped them to grow and develop in their Aikido training, business, and personal lives. They will share actual examples of how they've applied them with the hopes that you will see that these are truly universal principles that can be used in all aspects of our life. So now's my favorite part. I get to introduce these people that I just absolutely love. They're incredibly sincere students. And every time we have a seminar, two people you can count on to be positive and helpful, no matter what, is DB squared. Daniel, or Derek and Daniel um, B squared, I always say. So together they pack a punch and uh, it's just a pleasure to know them and I'm really looking forward to today's um, talk where they're gonna share with us their own experience. So really brief, because there's two of them, I wanna give them time and I've already used six minutes. Okay, Derek's martial art background. He goes back, he's been studying martial arts for 40, yes, four zero years. He started in karate and he earned his black belt in 1984. When he was a student at Fairfield University in Connecticut, he helped start a karate club, and he remained an instructor there for 10 years, 
all before he started studying Shin Shin Tozo Aikido, where he was introduced in 1995 under Mitch Sakoff Sensei. So small world. Um, Derek, help me out. Uh, you may have to unmute yourself. Mitch, wasn't he like either in Connecticut or Colorado? Was he a dean? He came from Boulder. He came from yeah, Boulder. Yeah, from Boulder. So originally he was one of Kashiwai Sensei's Absolutely. Students. Yeah. And uh, so this is great, you know, like one big family. Um, and he was also in education. He was. Um, and um, anyway, thanks for clarifying that. Um, and then in 2004, uh, Derek became the head instructor of Connecticut uh, Ki Aikido. Okay. And uh, Derek is a Nidan in Shinshin Toetsu Aikido and Shoden in Shinshin Toetsu Do. Danielle's martial arts background is easier to describe. She began studying with Butiker Sensei in 2006, and she holds the rank of Shodan in Shinshin Totsu Aikido and Jokyu in Shinshin Totsu Do, and she's the assistant instructor with Derek, under Derek, at Connecticut Ki Aikido. Let me say a few words about their work experience because that's what we're highlighting uh, today. Danielle has been working as an electrical engineer for uh, Sikorsky. Did I say that right, Danielle? Sikorsky? Sikorsky, yep. Okay. Had Sikorsky unmute, sorry. Air, I wanted to get it right. Sikorsky Aircraft since 2014. During her time at Sikorsky, she has had the opportunity to work on the avionics integration and test team, which includes working on a combat rescue platform including face-to-face -face meetings with the United States Air Force, their customer, and working in the systems integration lab. Most recently, she spent a year on the road supporting the program as a flight test engineer. That's pretty darn cool. And this involves travel to multiple contractor and customer facilities to support the air, aircraft flight test, such as working with the United States Air Force, the Navy, and at National Guard bases. Danielle has a Master in Science in Aeronautical Science, Human Factors from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. That is just cool. Derek. Derek, <clears throat> I've been following his career because the kinds of expertise that he brings to the companies that he's worked with, I rely on as a consultant big time, that you need lots of Derek's in organizations to actually pull things off. Um, so let me explain why I admire his specific skills and why they're relevant to today's conversation. In short, he's a process improvement leader. With over 20 years experience in financial services, data analytics, and manufacturing businesses. Uh, his strengths include rapid identification of problems, formulation of tactical plans, and implementation of effective solutions across global operational processes. And by global, I mean global. Uh, for many years, he was going back and forth in China, like just nonstop. And it was like, wait, Derek, do you have a life? Like, <laughs> no, no, he's, he's saying no. Um, in any event, uh, that skill is to bring people together from multiple uh, factions in the business. Currently, he's a program manager at a company called FactSet. Uh, research systems, where he develops relationships across all functions, including sales, legal, finance, and IT, in order to influence teams to ensure high-priority projects are appropriately managed. On time and under budget, right? Yep. Prior to that, and for many years, he was with General Electric, uh, a famous company that everyone has heard of. Uh, most recently, it was General Electric Capital, he was what was referred to as a simplification leader. And again, his duties required him to, <laughs> I'll say herd cats, <laughs> but in, in the business of, uh, in the language of business, his duties included cradle to grave management of projects, including effectively interfacing with all business functions, IT counterparts, leadership, customers, and buyers. Essentially, someone needs to organize and make sure all the pieces are coming together. And prior to that, where he got his analytics skills, I believe, is General Electric. Uh, it, when he worked with General Electric Energy Management, he was a quality operations leader. That means automatically at General Electric, he became a Six Sigma black belt. 
Um, and I'm sure he's a data-driven data guy at work. Um, so I really admire that. I'm not good at it, and I really admire people who, who are, because you really need them on your team. So interestingly enough, he has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Fairfield University that I already mentioned, and a Master of Science in Biology from the University of uh, Bridgeport. With those introductions, uh, Danielle and Derek, I'd love to turn it over to both of you. And I know you've worked with Freiling Sensei on uh, your, your presentation, so I will mute myself, get out of the way, and enjoy listening. Great. Thank you very much, Sensei. Very kind words. Um, so, Danielle and I are not, given our backgrounds, though, we are not accustomed to public speaking. So, in order to keep ourselves relaxed, <laughs> we're going to pretend this is just a party, all right? <laughs> a nice virtual party. You guys are all friends of ours. Um, and uh, you basically asked us four questions. Why did we choose Aikido? How do we train? How do we use our Aikido training and work? And how do we use it outside of life, outside of our working lives and our daily lives? Um, so we want to keep it light, interactive. If you have questions, let us know. Or I'm sure uh, Freiling Sensei can monitor any uh, chats that might go on and uh, we can make this interactive. At the end, we'd actually uh, hopefully save some time to hear from all of you because uh, we'd love you guys to share your stories as to how you use uh, the key principles in your daily lives um, because that's really what it's all about. We're only in the dojo, hopefully at least several hours a week, but the rest of the time we're outside of the dojo, so we really need to practice in our daily lives. Um, so to that point, why did we choose Aikido? Um, and, uh, sensei, if you could maybe put the first slide up. Great. Um, so we've all seen this. It's our motto. And I will get to this in just a moment as to why uh, we kind of chose this. But uh, again, I've been doing the martial arts for 40 years when I was 15 years old. So you can do the math to figure out how old I am now. But when I was 15, um, you know, I loved the martial arts. I wanted to get into it. It wasn't overly popular 40 years ago. Uh, but I loved watching Kung Fu Black Belt theaters on the weekends. Um, Bruce Lee was a god to me. <laughs> I had a little shrine and everything. Uh, uh, and I was just amazed at it. And I started studying uh, one style of karate. Uh, and I just progressed. Uh, once I got into Fairfield U, I actually started studying another style. So the first one was Young Mu Kwan karate. Then I moved into Tang Soo Do karate, uh, became a black belt in each, and an instructor at the Fairfield U Karate Club for Tang Soo Do. I loved it. I, I, I am so glad that I was able to study uh, another style. Um, I love cross training and just learning. I am the perpetual student. But the one piece that I could never really get into is I'm somewhat of a pacifist. I don't like hurting people. Even if they're mean to me or, or nasty, I, I just, whatever. You know, I'd rather just not deal with it. Uh, so even when I would go into sometimes competitions with karate, I did a few competitions and I generally did well. I trophied in some, but I almost always had to get hit first <laughs> for me to be like, all right, game on. Because I would just go in with this kind of happy feeling. Hey, let's, let's play. Let's do martial arts. This is cool. So I started looking around for another martial art that kind of fit that personality a little bit better. And um, I actually, I don't know how many of you know, I actually tried a different style of Aikido first. And let's just say they didn't emphasize compassion as much as we do. <laughs> and it ultimately I stayed with them for about six months. It was cool. I was learning very similar arts to what we practiced too. But the emphasis 
was very different. It was, I was basically just learning how to hurt people a different way. Um, so I actually stopped because I was like, this, this isn't what is working for me. This is not taking me to what I thought was the next higher level for my training. And I started doing Tang Soo Do again. And then I heard about, hey, down the street, uh, they just opened up another karate school and they actually have an Aikido program. And so m my friend who's now an MMA instructor and a, a great guy, uh, I've actually introduced Danielle to him too, fantastic martial artist, said, go check it out. So I checked it out and it was Mitch Sakoff sensei who Shane or Sensei kindly introduced. And it was Kismet. It was love at first sight. I I loved it. Um everything, even to the motto, which let's face it, coming from a karate martial background, uh let us have a universal spirit that loves and protects all creation and helps all things grow and develop. Some people from that martial perspective might have been like, what's this all about? I loved it. I was like, yes, that resonates with me. And then he just, he showed me how to keep one point, relax completely, everything that we do in our classes all the time. And I was like, yes. And I started to start learning techniques and started to realize that you could train at 100% coming, whether you're attacking or doing the techniques, ultimately you could get to full power, full speed, but at the same time, no, you're not going to hurt your partner. I couldn't do that with karate. If I went full speed, full power, somebody was getting hurt. So it was a different type of training to realize I could put 100% of myself into something and have this leadership and this control. Um, and it just very much resonated with me and I loved it. And it, it suited my personality of, again, I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to get hurt. So I want to protect myself. I want to protect the people that I love, the people who can't protect themselves. I want to take care of them. But just because somebody tries to hurt me doesn't necessarily mean I want to hurt them. And as we all know, this style is perfect for that mindset. So that's why I chose uh, the style specifically of Aikido. And I, I know Danielle had a little bit of a different origin story, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'd say some similarities, but a little more different. Uh, so I actually did do uh, some martial arts growing up for about three years or so, and then we moved to a different town. So I didn't stick with it uh, like I had wanted to, but with moving to a different town, as some people may have experienced that I experienced, was um, different people. Uh, there's uh, different personalities and you're not necessarily liked by everybody. So I actually was bullied a lot growing up and I always knew I was strong and I could put force behind that and could take somebody out if I wanted to. But, uh, you know, after some self-reflection and deciding that opening that doorway to using what I learned offensively and justifying it as self-defense was not going to help me in the long run. That's not something I wanted to carry with me throughout my life. So um, in my late high school career, when I started to research other styles of martial arts, I wanted to see what else was out there, uh, what else I could enjoy, but take with me. Um, so. I came across Aikido and I started researching dojos around me that were close to home, but accessible as well. And I came across uh, Derek and Seikoff Sensei in town and I went to go try the classes. Um, I tried the classes for about two weeks and decided, yeah, this, this is the place I wanna be. This is where I wanna stay. Um, and it helped me build a lot of confidence in myself and in knowing that I don't need to use that force um, and reining it in in other areas of my life, like with family and friends and at school. So it, and like everyone, it's 
a little bit of something I'm still working on, but uh, it, uh, it's been really, really important to me. Great. So why don't we jump into the next slide, which is how do we train? Um, and again, we're all very familiar with these principles, but it's actually the applying it and living it. And I, I, what I liked about this picture that we threw in here is that's the Connecticut dojo. It's, we're just having fun. We're, we're all there. We, we love this art, whether it's, we have uh, uh, three white belts right now. We have uh, a brown belt carrot. Um, we're just having a good time. And I, I think a lot of leadership is creating a open uh, environment that's conducive to learning. So it was very different from my karate background where it was discipline and, you know, there wasn't a lot of laughing <laughs> in my karate background. And quite honestly, if you're not laughing, you're probably not relaxed. And I think all the time um, to justify all my smiles is I think about Shinichi Toei Sensei and I quite honestly don't think I've ever gone to a seminar where he just doesn't have this great big smile on his face and it's filled with joy. So we, that's the way we train. We have this open, relaxed environment. And I think by having, fostering that environment, you, you naturally start to kind of extend key. You, you're not on guard, you're, you're starting, you're open. And you can start to notice all the different things that are going on in the dojo by being open and relaxed. As soon as everybody walks in, I always make a point just to say, how are you doing? How, how is your day? And a lot of times I may have an agenda, but then I'll hear how somebody's day was and I'll be like, you know what? We're gonna do something else tonight. So again, it's not even so much about what my agenda is. Uh, a lot of times I've read what my students are telling me and it's like, let's do that because that's gonna be a lot more fun and helpful. So there is this other section to this about not having to do things perfectly. We're learning how to do things uh, to the best of our abilities. Everybody's new, it's a journey, as I said, we're all students, we're all learning. So as we do this, I, you start to also understand how people are reacting and learning. So for instance, re respect your partner. Um, I've known Danielle for a long time now. I know her very well, it's going on 14 years. Um, she's a bit of a perfectionist, <laughs> okay? Which is great, I respect that about her. Um, it's one of the reasons why she's very good at Aikido. It's also a reason why she's very, very good at her work um, and has been really just going up with her career at Sikorsky in a very short time. Um, but knowing that and knowing your partner's mind and respecting your partner, uh, you start to notice things. And, you know, you can notice that she gets frustrated if she doesn't do it perfectly within a relatively short time <laughs> of learning. And that's, that's fine. And because I know that about her, um, you know, I don't want to keep on getting her frustrated. It, so I, it actually allows me to perceive how to help her better and to choose my words and my instruction better to, to help guide her to kind of self-discover how to move to the next level of a technique. Um, everybody's different. Everybody learns differently. Um, we have a lot of educators in this organization. So all of these educators know that, you know, there are verbal learners, visual learners, theoretical learners, physical learners. Um, 
everybody learns slightly different. And again, I don't make it about myself. I make it about the people that I'm trying to help grow and develop because that I, I end up learning that way too, is that how do they learn? And then I adapt my instruction, the words that I use, whatever, to what actually I see turns on the light bulb. Um, it's just not about me. And the other piece of it is staying humble and being open to criticism. And, and it's not criticism, it, it, it's correction, right? And, and we've all gotten corrected. And as Shino Sensei says, it's not a bad thing to be corrected, <laughs> right? And, you know, it shows that he cares, Pure Sensei cares, or what Sensei cares, Fryling Sensei cares. I think they all care a lot because they've corrected me a lot <laughs> over the years. But that's all good. That's all part of it. And I try to demonstrate that. I mean, there have been s seminars where well, Shane or Sensor, I remember a particular seminar in Philly where you spent a lot of time with me and I was leading cl the class. You had me up in front and you were correcting several things. Um, and I was like, I had my students there and I was like, hi, Sensei, and smiling. And yeah, you know what? I have to, I, it's not enough that I teach to be humble. I have to be humble. Um, and I have to be open. I need to show everyone that this is not a bad thing. This is how we grow and develop. We can't close ourselves off. So we just have to be open and listen and, and know that it's all coming from a good place of uh, development. Danielle, back to you. Uh, yeah, I just want to build on that. And um, I have seen that I, you mentioned that, that teaching helps you to to learn a lot. And um, I, I got that in quite a short period of time when um, Derek was traveling a lot to China. And I basically had to be the instructor for everyone that was left behind here in Connecticut. And uh, that, that helped me quite a bit to see things, to, uh, you, you know, see how see how the other students learn as well, you know, not just from me being the assistant off to the side or, you know, just one of the other students, but, but now I had to put myself in that teaching role and to, to put myself in the student's place and the teacher's place and to, you know, really get to know the other students. So when we have a new student, one thing that I find that I really like to do is to personalize any of the instruction that I'm giving to a new student. So uh, get to know the other person, you know, put yourself in their place. What are their interests outside of Aikido? What kind of job do they have? Where are they going to be taking this training that they're receiving in the dojo uh, and utilizing it when they leave? Because maybe they're there for three hours a week, but they've got all these other hours in the day or in their week that you know they could be practicing these skills that they're learning with us so one of the examples um, that i wanted to bring up is uh, for one of our students who was before she moved away was percy so if anyone had met percy she was just super sincere and and, and fun to be around and one of the things that you know she was really passionate about outside of aikido was color guard so she performed in the you know uh color guard for trumbull high school here in connecticut and working with uh color guard and marching bands and i've had siblings in marching bands friends in marching bands and it's like a big taigi um so being a performer like that requires you to uh be large you know you you can't be small you, you have to especially for color guard right you're twirling a flag or some sort of uh instrument and there's big relaxed movements you know if you're small the performance is just not going to look as good as it could as if you were using these 
big flowing movements. Uh, you need rhythm. Uh, you know, the color guard can't be off doing their own thing and then the band doing something else. The performance is just not going to be the same. So it's a partnership in that way. Um, and then the individual to the larger group. You you can't, you know, go one way and the whole rest of the color guard is going the other way because things are just not going to line up. So which leads to connection. You need to have that connection to the whole group. Uh, you know, it's, you need to feel. So you have all these people and all these moving pieces and parts, but they're still a leader. It's like a taigi, but also kind of like the oneness rhythm exercise. There's one person leading the whole thing, but everybody is doing all these similar movements together and feeling that connection. So with that, I think we could move to the exciting part and how we <laughs> leverage our training uh, at work. And thank you very much, Sensei, for the riveting uh, introduction. Um, that was very, very kind. Uh, so one thing that uh, Derek and I put together is, uh, and some of the material that we used for when we were coming together to talk about how we were going to do this presentation to everyone is, ah, Shainer Sensei's book, The Seven Arts of Change. Now it's perfect. So something he used for corporate change and, and development. So, uh, and in particular, we were using the, the second art, the art of compassion. Um, conflict is the nature of change. Um, you know, uh, Sensei talks about uh, the change process, you know, uh, there's an old agenda, you know, described as, as one energy, and here it's relative thinking, but it's, you know, in conflict with another energy, the new initiative, this absolute thinking. So, you know, um, put yourself in the place of your partner. Um, what are they thinking? Where, where are they stuck? But this relative thinking and how can we guide them to possibly a new better way of thinking that is good for everyone so i'd like to talk about my job um so sensei if you if you could um move to the next slide <laughs> Um, so I have a pretty cool job, as most people tell me, um, and as Derek likes to say, uh, we stay humble about it. So I'm, I know it's a cool job, but I like to stay pretty humble about it. And um, it's a cool I, job, Danielle. Yeah, <laughs> it's way cooler than mine. <laughs> so, uh, as an electrical engineer or a, a flight test engineer, if you will. Um, this particular project that I've been working on, I've been working on the same project for six years. And this contract that we're working with the United States Air Force um, is probably the newest conflict that's, uh, con <laughs> contract that Sikorsky has, uh, has had with, the cust with this particular customer in, in close to 20 years or more. Um, they usually work with other contracts with the Navy and the Army, but they haven't realized um, what a challenge that working with this new customer has been or would be. So for this particular project, we started with a baseline. A lot of people are familiar with the Black Hawk helicopter, similar to what our project looks like below, but different. And there was significant requirement and design changes, really significant. You know, a lot of people wanted to say that this project was, oh, it's just another Black Hawk with some upgrades. It was not. And I don't think they really, really estimated how much of a change and challenge it was going to be on 
both sides, customer, contract, suppliers, everyone. So everyone on all sides of the game uh, has an opinion on what that final product should be. But when we're talking about using these principles every day, you need to respect that. So here we are, the contractor having meetings with the customer all of the time, and you need to respect your partner's mind. You need to respect where they're coming from. So what we were constantly being um, told was, you need to look at this helicopter from the warfighter's perspective versus just a design on a piece of paper. You know, all the engineers or program management have an idea of how they want the meetings to go and how they want the design to be and what they think it should be for optimal design, but how is it really going to be used? So you need to put yourself in their place. You need to understand where these comments are coming from. Why are we perceiving them as negative comments or positive comments? Uh, and then beyond just requirements and design, you move into the test phase where my team comes into play. And that's the real world product, uh, this here. Um, so my job as a flight test engineer is to work side by side with the customer, real time. Uh, as you can see from the middle picture there, that is me from a couple weeks ago uh, down in Maryland <laughs> on a test flight. And um, most of the time, the crew in the helicopter is split 50-50. You have customer and you have contractor, and we need to we need to help both sides. So, an example of this would be the pilots that are flying these are experienced pilots, but most of the time they're used to a different model, similar but different, and the user gets stuck. They think they know where they're going with, you know, going down different pages to use a certain feature of the helicopter, if you will, and they don't know where to go. So they turn around and look at the engineers and say, I need help. I, I don't, this isn't what I'm used to. So you can't tell them that they're wrong or they don't know what they're doing. So you have, you have to use your own knowledge, put yourself in their place and say, well, if I was having trouble, I would want somebody to help guide me. So you need to help them, but you can't just do it for them. So you have to guide them to this new way of doing things and let them experience that kind of like in Aikido, where when you have a, a new person or even a, a, an experienced person that happens to be stuck, you can't do it for them. You need to let them experience this so that they retain that knowledge of having experienced it in a new way. And uh, much like that picture up in the top left corner, uh, quite the taigi with the helicopters, that is the first four helicopters, first, first, floor, te first four <laughs> test helicopters for our program, uh, flying together um, in a hover for this photo opportunity that you all get to enjoy here. Very cool. Try as I may, I work for a financial data analytics company. I could just not find a good cool picture <laughs> for my part of this, but just keep this up and, and I'll, I'll live vicariously through Danielle. Um, I too have to, in my work, have to deal with lots of different people. And again, one of the great things where key testing actually really teaches us to notice and start feeling the energy. And it doesn't take long before it, for instance, you can tell whether or not just by looking at a person, they're going to pass the test of standing while keeping one point. After a while, I, I even have some of my white belts, I'll, I'll stand in certain ways and say, 
would I pass? Would I not? We can't touch right now. <laughs> so everything is still 12 feet of separation. But they can see. And that's one of the great things about the key testing is you start to develop these senses of the noticing, uh, whether it's by touch, visual, hearing, hopefully not too much by smell, but um, it's it's been very helpful in regards to, in order to do the key test, you must be very relaxed, right? You must show greater relaxation than the person you were testing. And that allows me often to walk into these big program meetings and get a sense for the room and start observing people and, and how they react. Often I, I like to see how they react when senior leadership or when a project owner comes into the room. You know, do the smiles go away? Can you actually feel the tension in the room increase? People getting upper side? You know, or are they energized and are they like, oh, hey, I want to talk and, you know, that's my job as a program manager is to, to kind of read the room. And for, for those who maybe are feeling stifled, uh, not heard, to be there for them and to help their voices be heard. For the ones that are more challenging, it's my job to kind of try to mitigate that situation. And again, it's different for everyone. And it's very similar to Rondori sometimes where you got people coming at you with different energies, trying to do different things. Um, and you're there in the center, just trying to keep things moving smoothly, right? And so th that's where my Aikido training and, and noticing and especially uh, key training has really helped me to calm down, but yet still be very effective and, and move. By being this way, what I found also is because I'm relaxed, because I'm smiling, um, they can sense the compassion, right? As we said, the, the second art is the art of compassion. They can sense the compassion and it builds trust. And that trust leads to participation. They know that I'm not going to shoot them down when they speak. They know that I'm going to actually be a very attentive listener. I want to learn as much about this program and project too, because the more I know about it, the better I can help it be successful. So that compassion, you know, very much leads to the trust and building that team dynamic. And I become a confidant. Um, in today's age of a lot of the chats and, and, and video chats, as we're doing these virtual meetings, my chat board is getting lit up by various people. And some people may be saying positive things, some people are saying negative, and it's my job to either reply to them on the side, saying it's gonna be okay, we, we hear you, or write in during the video, moving things along. Uh, so I'm not there just because I'm supposed to be there. I'm actively playing a part and my part is actually to hear everyone's voice and hurt the, hurt the cats, right? And move them forward. And that's my dog. <laughs> So putting yourself in the place of your partner, again, is a, a perfect analogy for this is because if someone is quiet, I want to understand why they're quiet. Um, if somebody is being very almost aggressive, I like to understand why they're being aggressive. A lot of times what I find is that aggression in a business setting is actually passion. It's just, it's coming out wrong. <laughs> they don't know how to show their passion with a smile they're just coming down hard and so a lot of times i'm just listening and relaying back what i've heard and a lot of times the other people who are scared of this person are, are listening to me and say oh well that's a good point derek and it's like well it wasn't my point it was that person's point but whoever as long as we move the project along um 
looking at the time, I think uh, it's probably best we just jump right into our, our last piece, which is kind of also our fun piece of how do we do it outside of work and the dojo. So Danielle, maybe you go first. I'm pretty passionate about my Jeep <laughs> and uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fun hobby, but can also be an expensive hobby. Um, I joined a club and that's something that was definitely important, but it's kind of like, kind of like how Aikido is our club. Um, so situational awareness, knowing what you're getting into, and that can be in any situation, but for me in particular, can you drive it home? It's my daily driver. It's not just a toy. So I need to be super aware of everything that I'm doing. Um, keeping one point when driving or off-roading. You don't want to grip the steering wheel like your life depends on it. Uh, much like we do when we practice with weapons, hold it lightly because, you know, if it jerks or twists or anything like that, you don't want to get caught um, in the wheels. Uh, extend key. You know, um, a lot of people, maybe if they don't know, uh, it's very slow. Uh, Off-roading is a very slow sport, particularly with things like Jeeps or large vehicles. So you, you don't want to keep your foot, you know, pedal to the metal, and but you also don't want to ride the brakes. You kind of want to let the vehicle do the work for you um, and find its own path, much like you know, letting your partner tell you where they want to go when you're practicing Aikido. You don't want to force them into a path that they're not comfortable with. Um, you want to leverage the help of others, you know, um, that, like joining the group or, you know, leveraging the help of people in Aikido. Um, all these people here, they're not here to, you know, make you look silly or to make fun of you or tell you that you don't know what you're doing and you know if you think you can go and do this stuff all on your own it's probably not the best because at some point you're going to need that winch you're going to need someone to help you get out of that rough spot um and you need to respect others um there's you join this group you know for a reason whether it be Aikido or some kind of hobby group, you know, that the group is here to help you. And it's probably why you joined in the first place. So any group of people succeeds uh, based on a foundation of mutual respect and trust. Great. Uh, so my hobby, a little bit different. Sensei, if you could pop that slide up real quick. So I actually like to do something which is called adventure motorcycle riding, which basically means taking a motorcycle anywhere I want to, whether that might be on a highway or as you can see on dirt roads and often it's for long trips. Um, the, uh, the left side picture is actually from a trip I took with uh, my best friend uh, to Ecuador where we rode a little over a thousand miles through about 80% of dirt roads through Ecuador. The center picture is actually in Pine Barrens, New Jersey. Um, and this past July, I just finished a, a trip uh, about 2,100 miles. Uh, and that's my beautiful BMW motorcycle, <laughs> my baby. And that we took uh, we rode all the way down to Damascus, Virginia, and then rode the Appalachian mountain trails, roads, ridge lines, all the way back to uh, New York. And so what I found over the years is riding the motorcycle has so many parallels to performing Aikido. If you can see in that center one, with adventure motorcycle riding, they're generally larger bikes. They're not dirt bikes. Uh, that's an 800cc bike. They can go up to 1,250cc's. 
that are doing this this kind of riding, you're standing actually a lot so that your center of gravity is down at the pegs, it's not at the seat. And you can see that there is, you're trying to keep your elbows open, you're trying to be big. And since you're doing it for a long time, you need to be standing with good one point, otherwise you're gonna get fatigued. Other things, uh, very much like working weapons, it's, it's funny the parallels, as Danielle explains, her Jeep hobby and my motorcycle hobby, very different in many ways, but so many parallels where I need to hold the, the handlebars lightly. I can't try to over control the bike, otherwise more than likely I will fall. There is a, uh, a very good uh, adventure motorcyclist named Chris Birch out of New Zealand and I watch his videos all the time. And I had to laugh because I was watching a video on how to ride through ruts, okay? Um, if you get your bike into a rut and you try to over correct the handlebars, you're, the tire is going to hit up against the wall of the rut and you're going to fall down. He literally says, as he goes into it, he goes, no hands, no hands. Now he's not letting go of the handlebars, but he's reminding himself, just have a very, very light grip, just like we do with weapons and just help guide the wheel. But don't try to overly control it. And especially during this last trip, um, through the Appalachians, uh, sure enough, I hit a rut. And ruts used to be the bane of my existence. Um, I fell more times than I care to remember when I hit a rut. This time I literally called out loud, no hands, held it like the Boken or Joe. I went through it and I'm like, well, I wish I learned that a long time. I wish I had applied my Aikido <laughs> a long time ago to uh, motorcycle riding. So the parallels, this is just with the Jeep, with motorcycles, I don't think you'd have to try very hard to, to identify, oh yeah, I do this other hobby of mine so much better when I apply all the key principles uh, that we already know and we practice diligently. One other piece of this uh, is also learning how to stay relaxed. Aikido teaches us this, right? Especially Rondori is a fantastic example for that is, that is the teach point with Rondori is stay calm and just move. Um, when I was in Ecuador, in that picture, that's actually where uh, we hit a mud. We hit a lot of mud. It was very deep. And my friend whiskey throttled the bike. It hit a fence post and he snapped the clutch lever on the bike. Well, we happen to be in the middle of nowhere. And if you break the clutch lever, by the way, the, you can't do anything with the bike because you can't get it in gear. We were in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, so we first pulled the emergency phone that we had been received that's supposed to have service and we were in the middle of nowhere. Guess what? Had no service, no civilization to see anywhere. We knew there wasn't because we had been riding for a while too. There was no civilization for a while. So after a few choice words, you know, to relieve the tension, get that out, um, we just both actually became very calm. Um, my friend is actually ex-military, so it's, he is also used to having some situations out of his control and working it. Um, but we became very uh, calm. Uh, I knew my partner's mind. I, I knew that he was upset that he crashed and the bike broke, but we didn't yell at each other. We both knew none of that would help. We had to work the problem. Um, no blame was laid down. It's like, this is what adventure riding is for. It'd be a yawn if we didn't have things like this happen because it makes for a great story, <laughs> right? But um, we, I started laying out options and he got engaged and we refined our options and we, we reviewed our inventory, our tools, and we ultimately came up with a plan. That plan was him taking my bike because he spoke Spanish and I didn't, riding it all the way to the last town we found, getting a, a, a taxi service, which over there are actually pickup trucks and bringing it all the way back. Now that took about three, four hours. So I'm in the middle of nowhere with a broken bike, just kind of like, I'm sure he's going to come back. <laughs> he won't forget me. 
<laughs> his motto hopefully is no man left behind. And sure enough, after about three, four hours, he came back, we got the bike in. But again, it was, if we had just started yelling and getting combative, we would still be out on that dirt road. Um, but we worked it. And then by the time we got to the hotel late, late at night, because we had to get the bike fixed in between, we had a few beers and it was all good and it was fun to talk about. So ultimately, I, I, the applications are unlimited of what we can do with you know, these great learnings that we have from uh, our Aikido uh, training. And with that, you know, just like to open it up. I know we, we actually just went longer than we had planned, but we got chatty, so sorry. <laughs> But uh, whatever, if anyone has a, any questions or would like to share some experiences, we'd love to hear it too. Derek, thank you. I know that um, there, there are no chats uh, with questions, but I know that given the time, there's a couple minutes that we have left. Uh, I want to make sure we have time for Shannon Sensei to um, uh, you know, to wrap up the, the day and also talk about next steps. Uh, so, um, Shannon says, a, do we want to try to answer a question or two or, or given the time, should we go right into, um, yeah, just in case, at least give people an opportunity to, if there's a question or two briefly, um, I don't have much, uh, to say, uh, at the conclusion, but, uh, any, does anyone have a, a question or an observation? Uh, it's not so much a question as an observation. It's that uh, they remind me of one of the things that I absolutely love about Aikido, which is the people. I've always loved the people that I meet in Aikido, um, the energy, the attitude, the view of the world. And uh, Derek and Danielle are fantastic examples of that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really find that all over the world too. We train, you know, in places where our countries may or may not get along well, but the people that train Aikido always, you know, we have our motto, which really unifies us. And I love that that was, you know, uh, a joining a fundamental principle for the both of you in, in your beliefs. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, anybody else? I wanna thank uh, Derek and Danielle. Thank you for all of your preparations. And um, I, I, wanna, I wanted to remark, uh, Bob had, had made mention that he was looking forward to this, Bob O'Hare. And uh, he, he did uh, write to Orwat Sensei who wrote to me who said, you know, those five principles of Shin Shin Tozu Aikido that we also call five principles to lead others. I'd really like to hear more examples about that. And I said, well, it just so happens in two weeks, <laughs> there'll be two people talking about that. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. Uh, my, uh, my announcement for next week is we will not have class next Thursday. Um, so various, this is the first time in 24 weeks. But uh, Ileana and I will be away on the South Carolina coast without uh, sufficient uh, internet. And when I asked um, others if they wanted to jump in and lead class, it just turns out that next Thursday, uh, a lot of people are out of town, people who are, are typically our hosts, uh, um, as well as uh, Harold Sensei, who's chimed in in the past. So we're just gonna take a week off. And, and uh, next Thursday, there won't be a class. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for uh, being here. It makes it all worthwhile, and we get to feel that sense of community that uh, everyone's been talking about. So um, until next time, um, I love you all. I really do. Thanks for uh, being a part of this community. All right. God thank bless. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you, Sensei.